Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Nanomotor Mini Talk. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Babaka Nasorio. And he, he, he comes from the Max Planck Institute for Dynamic and Self Organization. And he is working with Professor Roman Gelestalian. And his talk, his talk will be on exact variety interaction of two chemical active particles. So let's welcome Babaka to, to share his research. So please go ahead, Babaka. Thank you so much for the introduction. And also thank you for nanometer, uh, thank you nanometer for inviting me to give this talk. So I'm gonna talk about exact fluidic interaction of two chemically active particles. The work that I done with Professor Golestanian at Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Cell Organization. The results of this talk have been already published in these two papers. So if you are interested, please have a look at them. They are both open source. Okay. I'm gonna talk about chemical diffusiophoresis, but what do I mean by that? Consider a bath of liquid full of little chemicals. And I'm showing these little chemicals by these little blue spheres and they are just diffusing around. Now what happens when I put a big colloidal red particle inside the system? Nothing yet happens because what happens is that this little chemical starts interacting with this colloidal particle through randomness, through Brownian motion. So we will have no net effect. What happens though, when this colloidal particle is chemically active itself too, then it can alter the concentration of these little blue chemicals and that may give rise to the motion of the fluid at the surface of this colloidal particle. And then cat, that can lead to the net motion for this colloidal particle. So how can we model this phenomena? Well, we can say all this activity at the surface of the sphere is contained within a narrow region surrounding this red colloidal particle. So if the thickness of this narrow region compared to the size of the sphere is a small, then we can replace all those activity with fluid asleep at the surface of the sphere. As if we say all those activity that happens with those little blue chemicals are now replaced with fluid sleeping at the surface of the sphere. And once we make that assumption, we can arrive at the very simple relationship for the net velocity of the big colloidal sphere as a function of that slip velocity by just averaging it over the surface. But what controls this phenomenon? Well, there are two important factors. The first one is called chemical activity. Here I'm showing it by alpha. And it characterizes how our colloidal particle produce or consumes these little chemicals. The second important characteristic is mu or mobility, which basically tells us whether or not our colloidal particle wants to go towards more concentrated area or wants to move towards less concentrated area. And for most of the talk, I'm gonna assume alpha and mu are isotropic, so they don't, they don't vary across the surface of the sphere. Okay, now let's have one of these colloidal particles, this chemically active particle, and put it in the bath of liquid of, chemically, uh, of these little chemicals. What happens? Nothing happens because everything is purely isotropic. So there is no preference in any direction whatsoever. So we will have no net motion. But what happens when we have two spheres, two of these colloidal particles, and each have its own chemical properties. So we have a sphere one, alpha one, mu one, and we have a sphere two, activity and mobility of itself. Now things get interesting. So we wanna look at this example at the limit when there is no inertia, so Reynolds is zero, and also there is no chemical advection, so Peckley is zero. The way we can go around solving this is that we first have to look at the chemical interactions, which is governed by the diffusion equation of chemicals. Once we solve that, we can solve for the slip velocities at the surface of each sphere. Those slip velocities account for the chemical activity. And once we have the slip velocities for each sphere, we plug it into a Stokes equation to solve the hydrodynamic interactions. And once we do that, we can find the velocity, the translational velocity of sphere one and sphere two. 
So if you look at it more technically, we have the diffusion equation or the harmonic equation for the concentration field of chemicals subject to two boundary conditions and no more flux at the surface of each sphere, which linearly depends on the activity of each sphere, alpha one and alpha two, then we use that chemical field, that concentration field to calculate the slip velocity at the surface of each sphere, which each scales linearly with the mobility of each sphere. And once we have the slip velocities, we plot them back in to Stokes equation as boundary conditions and solve the Stokes equations. And note that here, that we are looking for the translational velocities of sphere one and two, so uppercase V1 and V2, and we want to find these. Okay, now how can we actually solve this system of equations? Well, the way it is often solved is that we make assumptions and approximations. So the first approximation is that we say, well, let's say the gap size between these two spheres, delta, is very large and is much larger than the size of the spheres. And it's called the far-field approximation. Once we do that and expand, expand all the terms in terms of R over delta, which is a small entity, and get rid of all the higher order terms, what we end up with would be no hydrodynamic interaction and no near field chemical interactions. So the system gets super simplified and we can arrive at the very simple expression for the relative velocity. So here the relative velocity equals E, which is a unit vector showing the axis of symmetry, some prefactor at P, and then the chemical interplay of the properties. So based on this, we can understand that there would be two scenarios for the relative motion of these two spheres. If the chemical interplay is negative, then the relative velocity is negative, which means the two spheres come together and the interaction is attractive. And if that chemical interplay is positive, then the relative velocity is positive, so the two particles will move away indefinitely. But you can already see the problem with my arguments because the first assumption that I made was that the gap size is super large. But here in region one, the two particles collapse. So the gap size is essentially zero. So I'm violating one of my main assumptions. So what we want to show in this study is that what happens once we actually solve the equations without making these uh, uh, violations and these approximations. Let's do that then. We have the chemical field, the hydrodynamic interactions, which are connected through this boundary condition. Now we want to solve this exactly. Let's begin with the chemical field and the concentration field. So we have the harmonic equation subject to two normal fluxes. The way we can solve this exactly without making any approximation is that we can take the system to the biospherical coordinate system. And now we can solve this exactly regardless of the size of the spheres size of the gap size, and we can arrive at the concentration field and we don't care about the gap size. It can be large or it can be super small. We can arrive at the exact concentration field for the system of two spheres here. So the first part is okay. Now we want to look at the hydrodynamic interactions. Can we solve the Stokes equation exactly? And it's a bit more challenging than the concentration field for two reasons. The first one being that the Stokes equation for an axisymmetric system like this is actually a biharmonic equation, its psi being the stream function. So it's already a bit more difficult than a harmonic equation. But more importantly, the boundary conditions are quite complex now. Because if you see this bit, it has the state velocities, which we get from the chemical field. So once the spheres are changing their uh, distance from one another, the chemical field can get changed. So the state velocities change and the boundary conditions change. So it is difficult to, to solve exactly the circuit equation at every instance. But there is a trick that we can do to go around solving this. And that is called the Lorentz reciprocal theorem. And reciprocal theorem tells us that if you have a system in Stokes flow, and if the boundary conditions are complicated, you don't have to do, solve the problem exactly and directly. What you can do, you can find a substitution for your problem. So the same problem, it's the same geometry, but with more simplified boundary conditions. If you know the solution to that problem, 
then you can use this theorem to connect your simplified problem to your main problem and arrive at the final solution you're looking for. And here, what we choose is that we choose the two simplified version of the two spheres problem. Then we have two spheres, passive spheres, moving with constant velocity v, and two spheres coming together with a constant velocity v. Reciprocal theorem tells us that if I know the solution to these two, which I do, they are just super classical Stokes problems. They were done in 60s and 70s. Then you can use a theorem to find v1 and v2 for our more complicated problem. And note that this is not an approximation. This is the exact solution. It's just a theorem that helps us not solve this directly. So we do that. And then the hydrodynamic part is done as well. So now let's see what happens once we solve the photic system exactly. So here, I'm showing the relative velocity versus the gap size. The solid line is the exact solution, and the dashed line is the far-field solution. So as we talked, in region one, we had the attraction. And we see that the exact solution and the far-field solution are telling the same story. The relative velocity in both approximate, in both methods is always negative, which means the spheres will always come together and the relationship is always attractive. The values will differ, of course, here that we have a threefold difference, but still the story remains unchanged. And once we go to region two, we still see the same thing. Farfield thinks the, attract, the relationship would be repulsive because the relative velocity is always positive and the exact solution tells the same story. The values differ quite significantly, but we don't care about that because the story and the qualitative behavior remains the same. But there is a couple of points that Farfield can not capture. So there is a regime when Farfield still thinks is purely attractive. It still thinks that two particles come together and collapse. But in reality, after some gap size, when the particles get close enough, the interaction flip signs from attractive to repulsive, which tells us that there is an attractive region and a repulsive region in the same system, a behavior that Farfield cannot capture. And we call this regime three. We also have regime four, in which Farfield thinks that the interaction is always repulsive, but in reality, when the particles got close enough, the interaction from repulsive switches to attractive. So again, we have a repulsive region and attractive region. And these two new regimes of behavior cannot be captured with Farfield approximation. And these two new regime tells us that there can be a fixed point in the dynamical system. So let's actually dig deeper into that. So in regime three, we have a stable fixed point, which means if the particles are far, the interactions are attractive, but once they get close enough, it can switch and become repulsive. So what happens is that the two particles come together with a non-zero gap size and move together. And you can see that Farfield thinks the particles collapse and move indefinitely with super fast speed. But here you can see there would be a non-zero gap size. And we also talked about regime four, which we have, for which we had the unstable fixed point. So that if the particles are far from one another, nothing interesting happens and Farfield does a good job in capturing the behavior. But it's on a stable fixed point. If, so if you make the particles close enough, the particles collapse and swim super fast, while Farfield still thinks that two particles want to move away indefinitely. So what is different here? If you recall, I told you that using the Farfield solution, the relative velocity has is very simple form. So what happens once we do things exactly? Well, this, we have the similar form. Of course, it will be the different prefactor, but we have the same chemical interplay. But now we have this extra bit which comes from near field interactions. So we have this epsilon, which now captures the strengths of near field interactions compared to the full interactions. Now, if the particles are far, epsilon becomes zero, and we recover the Farfield solution as we should. But once particles are getting closer to one another, epsilon will have a non-zero value and a finite value, 
And that gives rise to these two new regimes of behavior. Then you may wonder, what is the source of this epsilon? Is it near field chemical interactions? Is it near field hydrodynamic interaction or is it both? Well, we can do an experiment here. Well, by experiment, I mean an analytical experiment, not a real experiment. So we can switch off hydrodynamic interactions and they still count for near field chemical, but no hydrodynamics. Then what we see is that the same equation appears, different prefactor, but the same form of equation. And this time this epsilon accounts for near field chemical interactions compared to the full chemical interactions. And again, it would have a zero value once the particles are far and find a value when the particles are closed. So the values will be different, but we can see that the chemical interactions alone can capture regime three and four. Now, what actually happens? What is the physical source of this new term and these new regimes? Well, let's look at this term by term. So the first term that we, already, we also saw for the four field interactions can be easily understood. So just look at this first bit, alpha two mu one. What this tells us is that a sphere two generates a chemical field which scales linearly with its chemical activity alpha two. Now a sphere one feels this effect and reacts to this chemical gradient by its own mobility mu one. So just from the perspective of particle one, we will have an effect and a motion which should scale with mu one alpha two here. And the same goes for the other particles, alpha one mu two. So the relative velocity will have this term. But we, what happens to this term? We can see that this arises from the near field interaction and it's fundamentally different. So the near field effect basically tells us that each particle reacts to its own reflection. So each particle generates this concentration field and reacts to its own reflection from that chemical field. And it, that effect gets reflected from its neighbor. So the neighbor here serves as a passive boundary from which each sphere reflects its own chemical field. As if we have our chemically active particle next to a wall because the wall can do the same reflection. But let's, let's actually look into this deeper. Imagine now we have a Janus particle next to a wall and the behavior should be similar. Because instead of the far field effect that we have for the two sphere system, for a Janus particle, which, is, which has this inherent asymmetry, that effect of the neighbor can be replaced by self-propulsion. So this Janus particle can swim because it has asymmetry in its coating. And that effect of the near field is now replaced by a flat wall. And we expect to see the same thing because my argument was that the near field is just a reflection from a boundary. And once we do the calculation for the velocity with respect to wall, we arrive at this relation, which has some prefactor and then one, and this one accounts for self-propulsion and the same kind of epsilon, which accounts for near field. And we see for some, for depending on the coating, the value of epsilon can be less, less than minus one, meaning that there can be a fixed point. So the same behavior happened and near field, again, here is the reflection from the boundary. So then you may ask, how perfectly should we tune the properties to arrive at these new regimes of behavior? So here, what Farfield, here is what Farfield tells us, that the phase diagram would look like this. If you have the activity ratios and the mobility ratios, regime one and two, purely attractive and purely repulsive, would be separated by a diagonal line. And here it's purely attractive, here it's purely repulsive. Now, if we switch on near field chemical, no hydrodynamic yet, just near field chemical, we will see that regime three and four start appearing in the phase diagram. And now if you switch on hydrodynamic as well, so now the full complete solution, we see that more than half of the parameter space is occupied by these new regimes of behavior. And if you look at this carefully, you can see that these new regimes, regime four and three, precisely are separating regime one and two, which tells us 
that there is no abrupt switching from pure attractive region to pure repulsive region. So if you want to move from purely attractive to purely repulsive, you have to go through these intermediate regimes in which you have a bit of both. And that makes sense. So if you look, compare these three phase diagrams, you can see that Farfield cannot capture this a smooth transition from purely, trans, purely attractive to repulsive or vice versa, but full solution actually does that. So now let's go one step higher. We talked about chemically isotropic particles and we talked about how we can separate the interactions into far field and near field. But what happens when we have Janus particles? Well, things are more complicated now because we cannot just say it's now for, for far field and near field. We have more complicated interactions. So let's look at it this way. Just from the perspective of particle one, we see that each side, each face of this Janus particle can give rise to self propulsion. So we have this geometrical, I call it geometrical function, which is just a generic function that accounts for the self propulsion. Then we have the reflection from the neighbor, that near field effect for each face as well. So we have the reflection from the, for the in, inner face and for the outer face. We also have the neighboring effect. So we have the neighboring effect from the inner face and the outer face. So we have five geometrical functions. I, I want to argue is that if we know these five geometrical functions, we can arrive at the generic relation for the relative velocity in terms of this and the chemical properties of the system. So with this equation, if we know the geometrical functions, we can know what will be the relative velocity. And because the system is linear, we can actually calculate this exactly for any gap size. And here I'm plotting them for the gap size being from 10 to the minus three to 10 in terms of the radius of the spheres. So with this in hand, we can see what kind of relative velocities and what kind of relationships we can see for Janus particles. And the question is how many fixed points do we get here? Well, the answer is three fixed points can appear. So we can have no fixed points, region one and two, oh, sorry, one and two. We can have one fixed point, a stable on and a stable region three and four, but we can also have two fixed points and three fixed points. So a stable on a stable, two on a stable, one a stable, or the other way around, which tells us the interactions are quite complicated. To just showcase the strength of and the complexity of this Interactions, let's look at the phase diagram for half coated particles. So the dark half is inert and the red half is active. And I'm showing the phase diagram for three configurations. So once the inert halves are facing each other, we see just two regimes, regime one and the regime with two uh, fixed points. Once the active parts are facing each other, you can see the complexity of the behaviors. And once one, the active and the inner part are facing each other, the interactions are even more complicated. So just to wrap up and just to have a take home message from my work, I have to say that near field interactions are important in phototech systems and we shouldn't ignore them because far field cannot capture the full story. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for your next talk. Now we are going to the Q&A session. And if the audience have this question, just uh, unmute yourself and ask us questions. Or you can type your question into the chat box. It seems like you explain everything and uh, all the audience gets answers. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too.
uh, let's wait for another 20 minutes, if 20 seconds, if no more question, we will conclude this talk, okay? Sure. Okay. Uh, can you see the chat box, uh, Abaka? Wait. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, about the reciprocal theorem. Let me actually go back to it. Um, wait, let me bring it up. Yeah, so the reciprocal theorem basically uses the fact that we have a divergence-free stress field. So a Stokes equation, when you're dealing, solving it, it is in fact just a divergence of the stress field being zero. And we can use that divergence-free field to connect two seemingly unrelated problems. And the Lorentz does not give us the full solution for our main problem. It only gives us this average force moments of the real problem. So let me explain that a little further. So once we have our main problem, which, have, which has very complicated boundary conditions, in this specific example, I'm not looking for the flow field. I'm only looking for the translational velocities, which is the force moment of the problem. And Lorentz tells us, and it has a very simple and elegant derivation. In fact, you can do it on a piece of paper. It tells us the force moments of this problem, which is our main problem, is closely related to force moment of any problem with the same geometry. So if I know the solution, the full solution to the, uh, uh, to the motion of a similar system, which is like this, then I can connect the two force moments. But the trick is that you need to know the full solution for your simpler problem, the full flow field, to be able to extract the force moments of the main problem. And if you look at it, we have two unknowns here, right? We have the velocity of the sphere one and velocity of the sphere two. So if you only had one, so if you are looking at just a single active particle, we only have one velocity to calculate, then you would need just one uh, auxiliary problem. And one, uh, so one system would be enough. But because we are dealing with two, we need two, we need to apply the reciprocal theorem twice so that we can solve for V1 and V2. And people use reciprocal theorem all the time for dealing with active particles. So it's especially for non-Newtonian fluids when you are dealing with the active particle in a non-Newtonian system, it is difficult to solve the non-Newtonian medium directly, but you can use the reciprocal theorem to connect that to a problem in a Newtonian fluid that you are comfortable with, solve that, get the force moment and find the velocity into the main problem. So Lorentz does that trick to connect your main problem to a very simplified version. I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. So any question from the audience?